What's up, everyone? It's your boy, Alombre. We are in the thick of the Kentucky Derby prep season. My guy, Matthew DeSantis, is in. What's up, Matt? Not much, man. How you doing? This is exciting. We've gotten like kind of two weeks worth of prep races, and we have a huge weekend coming up with the Bob Lewis, the Holy Bull, and the Withers, three big-time derby prep races. So exciting time to reflect on where we stand in this derby field. Yeah, we're going to look at the top 25 uh, consensus contenders tonight. And what we have here is uh, basically we've seen, you know, a few, several of these horses run on, um, you know, prep level races. And we've seen some at lesser levels that we've seen big speed figures from. We're going to try to make sense of all this and throw together a top 25 contenders list here. We've done that. Matthew, let's start at the bottom. We're going to start with the bottom of, uh, Again, top 25 list. And a lot of these guys are uh, horses we've seen one or two races from. Not not exactly sure what we've got, but let's start off. This is our best attempt at, at finding that Derby winner for for that um, elusive Kentucky Derby gate. Let's start with number 25, Jace's Road, who we saw over the weekend. Uh, he mm -hmm. ran fifth in, this, in the Southwest Stakes. But he did show us enough to at least uh, have his name on this list. Why did he show us enough, Matthew? You got anything on Jace's Road? Yeah, I think the reason he's still on the list, even though it was a poor effort at the Southwest, is because it was in the slop. Anybody who watched that race saw it was just horrendous conditions at Oaklawn Park that day. And really, Jace's Road's two worst efforts have been in the slop. So you could easily draw a line through those two races and go, listen, this horse just does not like bad conditions. I don't want to judge this horse and get him off this list until I see him on a fast, dry track. And then I can kind of go, okay, maybe this horse... Was a little overrated for Brad Cox, but ultimately coming sneaks in at kind of 25 at the bottom end of this. And like I said, we'll still want to see one more effort from him before making a determination. Does he go up or down from here? I agree. We we all, uh, everybody, including uh, the TVG broadcast I was watching, said Jason's road does not like the, the, the slop, the mud, and uh, proved actually a little better than I thought he would finish there, to be honest. So... Moving along, number 24 is Loggins by Ghost Zapper, Brad Cox trainee. Uh, this was a horse that was big, big name early on mm -hmm. uh, in the in the you know quest for the Kentucky Derby gate, but looks like he may not even be targeting the, the Derby here. But we've got him on here kind of as a nod to how great he has been. What, what do we have on Loggins? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we just don't have much. I mean, we have updates from Brad Cox saying that it seems like he's going to return to action in February. This is a horse that has not worked since October. Uh, so it's been several months now that he's not even worked out. Uh, obviously, that epic duel in the Breeders' Futurity with Forte. And then Forte, of course, goes on to win the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. So there's a lot of expectations with this horse. Seems like maybe the Preakness is the target, but too talented to leave off this list. And I'd like to at least get one workout from him and kind of one more update from Cox to know something definitive before taking him off the list. Exactly. You just said it. We, we just don't know on a lot of these horses at this point, but it's still fun to speculate on the top 25 and try to figure out who we've got here. At 23, a horse by Tappet, Signator, Shug McGahee, uh, winner last time out of Aqueduct at the mile distance. What else do you have on uh, Signator, Matt? Well, Signator, I would start paying a lot of attention to this horse at Gulfstream Park. Uh, Shug has shipped him down to Gulfstream Park. He's been working regularly the last couple of weeks. I have a feeling that he's going to be earmarked for the Fountain of Youth card. I don't know if he'll run in the Fountain of Youth per se, but I wouldn't be surprised if he runs on maybe a high-level allowance race in that particular uh, day's card, but it seems like he's getting back on the regular workout tab. Lots to like there. Suge always brings him along slow, uh, but a really good prospect. All right, number 22, we had the first Baffert entry, uh, Newgate by Into Mischief. Is running in the Robert B. Lewis stakes this coming weekend. Mm -hmm. um, Newgate has had a pretty, pretty solid history here, a short history, but Baffert cannot get points. We all know this. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a four-horse race in the Robert B. Lewis at Santa Anita, mm -hmm. which has kind of turned into a, a Twitter joke here. Mm -hmm. Unfortunate, but no points. What what do we see on Newgate? This is going to be a quote-unquote practice run, a dry run for Newgate with no points in the line. But Yeah, pretty much. I mean, and we should say that Baffert has the most horses on our new top 25 list with seven. Brad Cox has six. Uh, so you're going to see those names pop up a lot into mischief. I should also point out is the leading sire from our top 25 list with, uh, four of his progeny on our list. 
Uh, Newgate, you said it best, solid. You know, he's not spectacular. He finishes underneath a lot, but he runs right there. The other Baffert monsters, so to speak, that we're going to get to a little bit later in this list are not running in that Robert Lewis. This is, a, I think, a prime prime race for Newgate to win. If he's going to kind of prove how good he is, then this is going to be where it happens. Of course, you could say that, take that with a grain of salt because it's going to be a four-horse field with four horses trained by the same. <laughs> so it, it is the state of California racing, quite frankly, and does a derby race actually, does a derby prep race actually exist? if no points are awarded at all. So uh, a sad state of affairs out in California for that. Absolutely agree. Number 21, Dale Romans trained another into mischief, Cyclone mischief, who's running in the Holy Bowl this weekend at Gulfstream at 21. What do we have on him? Yeah, I like the way Cyclone mischief has kind of come back and come into the Holy Bowl race. This is a horse that broke his maiden and then went straight to the grade two Kentucky Jockey Club where he finished seventh behind Instant Coffee and, and Curly Jack and some other really good horses. What I like is the horse then went back to Gulfstream Park, went to an allowance level race, a high level allowance race, won that race at a mile with a lot of ease. Get that horse's confidence back up before now running in the Holy Bull this weekend. Uh, I, I think Cyclone Mischief has a lot of talent. He's won it two turns already, broke his maiden going two turns at Keeneland, going a mile on the 16th. So I don't think that's really the issue. Uh, we'll see how good this horse is. We, you know, this is a horse that could really skyrocket up the rankings, uh, depending on how, what performance he turns in at the Holy Bowl. Yeah, he did have a strong speed figure there last time out at Gulfstream. So yes, agreed 100%. Let's move along here. Uh, number 20, National Treasure, who is a uh, familiar name from the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and uh, third in the Sham Stakes last time out. What's the plan with National Treasure? Do we know anything on him yet from Baffert? You know, I don't know if we know anything in terms of what the plan is. Uh, he's got, Baffert's got such a deep barn that you just don't know where he's going to place all these horses in order to try to get them reps, so to speak. We don't know what's going to happen with trainer changes to get Kentucky Derby points and what that might mean. But National Treasure's a really good horse. Finished third at the Beer Eaters Cup, uh, uh, Juvenile, and Maybe a horse that finishes underneath may have a little bit of a horse that was very near and dear to my heart, a little bit like Midnight Bourbon, kind of always finishes in the money in these big spots, is never good enough to fade entirely, but may not be good enough to win all the time. Uh, but a very, very good horse whose pedigree suggests the more distance, the better. So the more they go to that mile and an eighth, mile and a quarter distance, National Treasure is your horse. May get better with time over the derby prep season here. Uh, at 19, we have Extra and Yeho. By Into Mischief, Steve Asmussen's first entry here, who's he's got a few as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one last out back in October, though, right at Keeneland? Yeah, and this is the same way. Oxford and Yeho and Loggins are kind of two horses that are telling the same story right now, which is they both looked great in October and they've not really been seen since, not even on the workout tab. Uh, the thing is, extra on Yeho just looks so impressive. Uh, breaking his maiden that everybody kind of said, This is Asmussen's Derby horse. Uh, and Asmussen's not really given a lot of updates. So, again, this is a horse that next iteration of this list may not be on it at all. Uh, and as we get more updates from Asmussen, but a super, super talented Colt from uh, out of Into Mischief. So, uh, definitely a lot to like there. Next up is the number 18, Steve Asmussen's second entry here. Uh, by Quality Road, first defender is new to our list, mm -hmm. and that is because uh, last time out he he won on debut uh, January twenty first at Fairgrounds. On Lecompte Day, yeah, on the yeah, Lecompte yeah. undercard, and uh, was super impressive in that maiden. This is a horse again that will like getting stretched out to two turns. I was actually super impressed how well he handled more of a sprint distance the first time out. A lot of times these horses that are Derby horses, you know, they're they're big horses. They've matured. They need more distance to unfurl that stride of theirs. And he looked really quick, too. I mean, and, and he looked like he wanted more distance. I mean, he was pulling away down the stretch, but really showed a, a, some quick twitch turn of foot, uh, I thought, there in, in a sprint uh, debut. So very much so like first defender. Yeah, at this point in the season, we have not seen these these horses face off against the other elite horses. So it's, it's just tough to tell. I mean, it yeah. really is, which is part of the fun. I think it's fun to watch these, these horses uh, – uh, prove themselves as a elite horse. And then, you know, a couple weeks later have to go in head to head with another horse that's at the same level, which is fun to watch here. So uh, at 17, a Todd Pletcher joint mm -hmm. by Tappet, Tappet Trice. Yeah. And uh, he won last time out in December at Aqueduct. 
Yeah, but we're going to see him this weekend at Gulfstream Park on the undercard. And I think that's why I'm pretty high on first uh, or on Tapatrice, I should say. That's a really nice allowance race on the undercard of the Holy Bull this week. There's a couple of nice horses in there. Uh, and Pletcher, I think the fact that he moved this horse down to Gulfstream over the winter kind of tells you what he thinks of this horse. I, in my opinion, he's going to bring his best horses down to Gulfstream. And the fact he's bringing them down there, I would say Fountain of Youth is a very realistic next stop for Tappet Trice if he runs well in this allowance race. I think this is a very much so ascending horse we're going to hear a lot about. Speaking of Gulfstream, the Risen Star, uh, two fills, number 16 by Hard Spun, the Larry Ravelli train, trainee. Uh, what do we have on two fills after a nice performance, second place at Lecompte? Where are we at now? Yeah, I think that's kind of what we're, I think that was a very nice effort from two fills. And I, though in my notes, I have two fills as kind of a lesser version of instant coffee kind of sits mid pack a little further back and then makes a move uh, a little bit like instant coffee does. Maybe not quite as talented, probably doesn't have maybe the top end speed, but is a nice horse and is a horse that is going to give you an honest effort every single time out. It seems like, it seems like he fires pretty much so every time out and you know, for a trainer who is maybe not huge on the national stage in Larry Ravelli, but I think a really legitimate derby horse that, and here's the thing, we saw it last year. You don't need a ton of points to qualify for the derby. And two fills strikes me as a horse who can finish second or third in a few big prep races as we get closer yeah. and get the points necessary to get in the starting gate. I have my notes. My impression on this horse was that the best was yet to come from him. Yeah, too. Just, that was yeah. the impression I got. Uh, to watch him finish at LeCompte. So let's go ahead and move on to the next page here. 15 through 11. Uh, 15, we got the Yak Teen. Practical <laughs> joke, sired. Practical move. Mm -hmm. uh, the, he's a Los Alamitos Futurity winner back in uh, whenever that was, December. Yeah. And he also finished third in a competitive Bob Hope field. What, what do we have on uh, practical move here? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a wait and see, but you have to respect the fact that he's beat, you know, he, he beat won the Los Alamitos Futurity. It'll be interesting because one of the other horses that ran in that race, Arabian Lion, not to be confused with Arabian Night, uh, is coming back and running in that Bob Lewis. Now, how well Arabian Lion runs in that Bob Lewis may end up impacting how what you think a practical move. Because yes. if 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 Arabian Lion runs really well, then maybe you go, wow, practical move might be a really big deal. Uh, if Arabian Lion doesn't fire for the second straight race, maybe you're going to go, eh, okay, maybe it was just a fluky race at Los Alamitos, you know, and, and you never know. So I'm interested to see where Tim Yakteen moves him next, but uh, definitely a horse you got to keep an eye on and uh, one of the few non-Baffert California horses to pay attention to. Don Baffert, which is where Yakteen moved a lot of, or uh, I'm sorry, Baffert moved a lot of his horses to Yakteen last year, so we'll see if that's... yep. If that's a piece here, but at 14, we have Curly Jack, the first of three good magic sired horses on this, mm -hmm. uh, this group of five by Tommy Amos. Curly Jack, what do we have on Curly Jack? I mean, second in the jockey club, right? Mm -hmm. Instant coffee last time out. What do we know? What we know about him is maybe a little bit like two fills. I just feel like you're going to get an honest effort. I don't know if you're going to see a horse that's going to be a winner a lot, but this is a horse that feels like he's always going to finish right around the money, going to finish on the board, going to rack up Kentucky Derby points potentially, and maybe get enough to get in the starting gate. Um, you know, is one of the more seasoned horses from this group, six career races, uh, but only two wins. And so, you know, we'll see. It hasn't demonstrated the ability to beat the more elite horses in this field. But like I said, you can rack up a ton of points if you finish second or third in the bluegrass, second and third in the risen star, second or third in some of these other prep races, you can get enough points to qualify for the Kentucky Derby. Absolutely. Uh, moving along here, number 13, Hajazi by Baffert and Bernardini. The notes I have, it says San Felipe. Um, last time out, he was a big winner, big speed yeah. figure, very impressive. What do we have on Hajazi? He's a really interesting horse. He could end up making us look stupid only having him at 13 because he has freakishly good speed. I'm not entirely sure he wants derby distance. I'm not entirely sure he wants the two turns. I think he's maybe a little bit more like a horse like having a meltdown, who's another great Baffert sprinter. Um, 
I'm going to be interested to see how he runs uh, on the, on the derby trail very much uh, because I think underneath there's a lot of sprinter pedigree and I just don't know there, there might be some distance limitations, but incredibly talented, incredibly fast and posted one of the best speed figures for this entire three-year-old crop in debut. So, I mean, He's got the talent. That's not the problem at all. It's just, I think, the, the distance a little bit. And But Baffert seems to really like this horse. Uh, the quotes about Hijazi after that last race, uh, Baffert said, we're going to have some fun with this horse. You don't hear him say that a lot. No, that's that's usually a tall order to, to impress Baffert. He has seen some of the, the best of all time. Yep. Uh, speaking of Baffert, number 12, also a Baffert-trained horse. Yeah. By good magic, reincarnate. Who's also, I believe, targeting the San Felipe. Uh, yeah. Reincarnate was the winner of the sham. What do What do we have on him? Yeah, winner of the sham, who was a kind of the last thought in that race. There were other Bafferts who were more prestigious and and kind of a bigger deal. And reincarnate goes out and wins the race. And I just I this horse looks like he's matured a lot. This horse looks like he's filled out a ton. This horse looks like he gets it. Looks like he's super mature, and just walks around like he knows he's the man. And and there's something to be said for that. You pick up on those vibes when you watch horses. Uh, so reincarnates a horse that, uh, even though he was maybe a lesser thought of Baffert horse, I think he's, a, he's got a lot of talent and beat and and easily beat uh, his stable mates in that sham. Yeah, absolutely. And and to be a lesser thought of horse in the Baffert stable is usually not necessarily a bad thing because. Yep. I always say authentic. We talked about it before we went live. Yeah. Authentic was Baffert's third or fourth horse in that year. Yeah. Um, and just the timing worked out. And I'm not going to say what I really think, but uh, <laughs> let's just say the uh, everything clicked at the right time and yep. uh, authentic did what he did. And yeah. it wasn't necessarily, he was definitely what, uh, third or fourth most hyped on the Baffert charts that year. So. Mm -hmm. Baffert usually runs deep, baby. So number yep. 11, we have uh, the Chad Brown, first Chad Brown entry, Blazing yep. Sevens by Good Magic. And in my notes, all I have is fourth in the BC Juvenile. What yep. is next? What are we doing here? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. I think Chad's given him some time off after that. I mean, he has given him some time off after that. Uh, I would imagine you're going to start seeing him. You're not going to see him, obviously, at the Withers, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see him in that New York circuit, you know, with, with the wood uh, later on. Um, he's kind of the opposite of Jace's road in that. I think he really likes an off track. Uh, I think he likes the slop and, uh, cause that's how he won the champagne was in the slop. So, uh, that, that something to keep in mind, but super talented horse. Anybody who finished in that top three, four at the breeders cup, uh, you got to take seriously, especially yeah, when they yeah. have another G one on top of that. Yeah, I think blazing like blazing sevens is a huge unknown. There's there's a couple yeah. there's a couple huge unknowns, and he's one. He's up. We've got him ranked at eleven consensus for a reason. I mean, yeah. he's been impressive in the past, but we just don't know. Yeah. Uh, number ten. This is a high riser this week. Yeah. Determinedly. Yeah. By Cairo Prince, Mark Cassie, heading to the Risen Star. I believe is that what you're hearing too? What do you have? That's on what that, that's what I'm hearing as well. And determinedly is a great example of a horse who has had his profile improved by the horses that beat him actually, yes. uh, as well as the horses that he's beaten. Uh, and so he beat a horse Tappet's conquest last time out of the other Lecompte undercard. A lot of people like Tappet's conquest. The other thing is this is a horse that lost to Arabian night when Arabian night broke his maiden so impressively at the Keeneland undercard determinedly comes back, breaks his maiden, and then also wins an allowance race and then wins the second allowance race after that. So this is a horse that's absolutely trending the right direction. Uh, I was really impressed at that LeCompte undercard race because he broke and the horse to the outside of him was supposed to go to the lead and did not. And so determinedly ended up wiring the field, which is not something he's demonstrated the desire to do in his career. So showing that versatility, showing that ability to go like, listen, if nobody else goes, I can go. I have enough speed and stamina that I can wire a field as good as that one that day. So I just think this is a really good horse. And if you really believe Arabian Night is the real deal, then determinedly can't be that far behind. That's exactly what I was going to say. Arabian Night won impressively this past weekend. We'll get to him in a minute, but mm -hmm. yeah, if you were if you're in the same conversation with that horse, 
I think you're in the you're worthy of this top ten seating that we've got them in now. Yep. Uh, moving la- moving along to number nine, Red Route One by Gunrunner. Uh, second to Arabian Night again. Speaking of Arabian Night. Yep. And the and Southwest I, thing looked very competitive to me. I mean, yeah. Arabian Night, I think, is the cream of the crop. It, I mean, we, you'll see in a second here where we have him ranked. Yeah. But Arabian Night, wildly impressive. Yeah. And Red Route 1 did not look, you know, substantially, you know, on a different level. I mean, it was not like a 40-length 40, 40 runaway. Yeah. I thought two, he, he looked respectable. Two different types of horses. I mean, Arabian Night, obviously a front runner. And Red Rat One is a closer, and he's a gun runner. And we should point out, we mentioned it before that Southwest was in the slop. Gun runner progenies love the slop. Gun runners are winning at a 25% rate on wet dirt surfaces. That's incredible. His half sibling, so he's he's even got this kind of slop influence from his mother's side. His half sibling broke his maiden on slop. So, I mean, Red Route 1 was, like, made for the Southwest. But setting that aside, this is a horse that ran into some trouble last time out, kind of got stuck behind a horse that was backing up and, and wasn't able to really put on a run. Uh, Red Route One's a good horse that I like a lot uh, for Steve Asmussen. He's a gun runner, so you, you always have to take that seriously. Uh, I think this horse, again, is only going to get better with more races and more distance. I uh, really like this horse quite a bit. Yeah, me too. I think it's going to be interesting to see what he does next. Uh, number eight, the next Baffert entry by Curlin Faustin, who actually ran second in the San, v- San Vicente, lost to having a meltdown. But to those who watched that race a little bit closer, you saw you saw a horse that was finishing stronger than he ran the entire race. He, he was finishing at a clip that looked faster than he actually yep. started and uh, looked like he had a lot in the tank. Which is bodes well for the for the Derby Trail. What do you have on Faustin? Because we have him having a meltdown is not even on our list. In case you didn't notice, spoiler alert: he's not in the top five. Right. Because, I mean, we just don't think he's he's geared toward the Derby. Maybe he will be. Who knows? I don't know if he's officially off the trail, but yeah, I mean, but I haven't to your point. Having meltdowns had five career races, and they've all been sprints. And so Baffert made a point actually when talking about Arabian night that he typically likes to have a horse go short twice and then stretch out. Well, having a meltdown has never gotten tested to stretch out. So that makes me think Bob doesn't really have any plans to stretch that horse out. Uh, I think he's just going to be an elite sprinter out there, which is nothing wrong with that. It can be another gamine. And so with Faustin though, this is a horse that absolutely is bred for distance. And if you watch that race, the San Vicente, even watch his main, he doesn't get away that fast from the gate. He doesn't have this great sort of speed. And he's an interesting type of Baffert horse and that he's a grinder, really. He just kind of keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps coming in and just keeps seems to get faster as the horse races goes longer and everybody else gets fatigued. He keeps going. So I, I think I can't wait to see him go two turns because I think that's when you're going to see the real horse. Uh, and I think he could end up being in, easily in our top you know, three or four at that point. Yeah, with the way he closed, and like you said, he he didn't seem interested until the second half of the race. Yeah, but once he tuned in, it was he he was stride for stride. Oh yeah, um, and it was it was impressive. And I think like like you said, I think he's uh the more distance the better with his horse, and that's that's what you want to look for in the uh, Triple Crown preps here uh, with Faustin. So number seven, we have Instant Coffee, another Cox by Bolt Bolt Doro, uh, going to the Risen Star. Instant Coffee won the LeCompte impressively. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's a whole lot of negative to say about him here. What do we have uh, on Instant Coffee at number seven? Yeah, hard to like you said, hard to say anything negative. I think the biggest issue I have with Instant Coffee is he's not eye popping necessarily. He doesn't kind of make you go wow. Uh, he comes from the back. He's a grinder. He doesn't have elite turn of foot though. He's not like this closer that you're just like wow. All he, I can't believe he's just you know, gobbling up the field as he's passing people. Uh, he just kind of wears them down. And I just don't know how well his running style works for the Derby and big fields in particular. We should point out that Lacombe field was six horses. It's easy to come from the back when you're only sitting sixth. Yeah. It's more difficult to come from the back when you're sitting 14th, uh, when you're sitting 18th, you know, in some of these bigger prep races that we're going to run into. So uh, that that's where my concern is. But he absolutely deserves to be as this high because I think he's going to continue to rack up a ton of points and qualify for the Derby. Yeah, he's going to be in the gate. I mean, he's he's yeah. going to be a factor. 
And the fact of the matter is, like when we when it comes to closers, you can we can uh, speculate all we want, but if it's a race like last year, sure, where we saw Rich Strike pull the upset of a lifetime, if you get a you know two or three burners up front that burn up all the stalkers, which is exactly what happened last year, yep, it it bodes well for horses like Instant Coffee, and we'll see. I mean, yeah. Who knows if these uh, the trainers even have their strategies down pat with what are they doing with these horses as far as uh, strategy? Or the, how close are they going to stalk? Are they going to try to get to the front? This and that because, I mean, like somebody like Cox has, what, seven or eight entries in the top 25? He's, yeah, he, I'm sure yeah. he's uh, he's looking at the replays and playing these things through his head too on, on just exactly what the strategy will be. That's the beauty of horse racing. Uh, another Cox entry at number six, Into Mischief Sired giant mischief and in my notes all i have to say is second the springboard mile at remington mm -hmm. why do we have him ranked this high what is it about him because a yeah. lot of us do yeah I, what if you watch that springboard mile you understand why he's ranked this high because he completely blew the break and was behind the entire field which is not his running style at all and he circled that entire field and was closing like a freight train late and almost won and I just think he demonstrated, I like it when young horses face adversity and overcome it and don't just pack it in. Short horse just showed me so much ability to be able to do that. And I, I'm really excited to see where he goes next. I mean, I'd imagine he'll be on that Oaklawn circuit, uh, given that he, you know, has been running at Remington and Oaklawn and things like that. Maybe go down to fairgrounds, but Cox likes to keep him in the Midwest. So, uh, you know, I, I can't wait to see where he goes next, but that was just such an impressive second place effort. And like I said, it, it was reminiscent. Some people might remember this reminiscent actually of last year's Holy Bull with simplification. Simplification went into that race, had only ever won on the lead, blew the break, had to circle the entire field, finish second to White Barrio. But that showed me something that day. What happened next? What uh, simplification goes on, wins the Fountain of Youth next out, finishes fourth in the Derby. So there, I think that that's that ability to bounce back from a setback really shows something. Absolutely. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. And that's exactly, I mean, sometimes the, uh, the finishing position does not show the whole story. Like you said here. Right. So for those who watch that race, yeah, we, we get it. He's, we've got him higher than his statistics would probably uh, lend, but there's a reason for that. And, you know, a lot of speculation on what's coming next there. So, Let's move up to number five. A lot of speculation on Cave Rock uh, by Arrogate, the Bob Baffert trainee. What is happening? I mean, we have not seen much from Cave Rock since a, a brilliant effort, by the way, in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. I mean, this is this horse is clearly one of the best in the crop. What yep. do we have here? Yeah, it's it's a little bit of an out of sight, out of mind. I mean, Cave Rock was number two, yeah, I think, in our uh, last ranking, and you know, it was pretty high up there. But it's one of those things, like you know, the best ability is availability as they say in sports. Like it's, yep. it's, if you're not training, if you're not working, if you're not, if you're not, uh, you know, running, then it, you start to move down this list a little bit and uh, it doesn't matter how talented you are. And so, uh, cave rock is a horse that I just, you know, we've, we've not heard a lot out of and Bob hasn't really shared a lot of plans in terms of where he's going to be going next. So it's a little bit of a wait and see it's understandable that he got a, a nice long break. And we should point out Forte who won that race, also has not raced since then. So it's not surprising yep. uh, in that regard. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I think there's just some other horses that have started to run really well lately that are now kind of passing him by. Again, one more effort out of Cave Rock, though. He could be right back up at number one on this list. I'm thinking I'm, my my philosophy is that Baffert is waiting to just place him in the one prep to get him the 50 points or 100 points or whatever to get him into the field. Just probably spot, you know, waiting for the spot. Because, like you said earlier, it's it doesn't take a ton of points to get in. I mean, we, yeah, we we've seen it last the last couple of years since the points have changed a little bit. Uh, all you got to do is win one one of the uh, semi majors, not even the hundred pointers, but the fifty pointer. We, uh, Cave Rock's gonna he's gonna be uh, you know if he's anything like he was in the Breeders' Cup, and Baffert knows this, and nobody else does at this point. Doesn't seem like yeah. based on his run at. Um, the Breeders' Cup juvenile, he's yeah. he's right there with any of these horses, and oh, absolutely. I think and, we're just kind of uh, waiting with bated breath to see what's next for him. Yeah, and to your point, you know, Rich Strike qualified for the Kentucky Derby. 
based upon a third place effort in one Kentucky Derby yeah, prep race. Exactly. That's how many, I mean, that's how few points you need to get to qualify for this field because some horses are going to scratch. Some horses aren't going to want to run, you know, these things. They happen. try to get them so, in the right one. You, you try to spot your horse in the right one, get them yep. qualified and then you're done. That's, that's yep. the way it works. Nowadays, yep. So. yep. Especially with all the Baffert zeros like we have in the Robert B. Lewis, where there's four horses running, and none of them are getting points. Now there's yeah. that many more points uh, to go around. Yeah, the rest of them, which is unfortunate. But yeah, next up, number four, verifying by Justify and Brad Cox, my favorite combo. Uh, as far as uh, all these Derby, I, I'm a Justify fan. I know, I know, I don't need the story. I know what I know what Justify <laughs> is. Yeah. But it was still fun to watch him. Oh, you know, I, I do think he's, his progeny is going to be monstrous. By the way, and they were very good. First crop, very very strong. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it, that was very tight between he and Bolt Doro at the end in terms of who was going to be the top first crop sire. So uh, he's turned out good progeny thus far. And verifying is a horse that returned to, to Oaklawn to really romp in, in a big time allowance uh, race. And I'll be interested to see, obviously, where. You know, he's going to be going next, looking like the Risen Star. That's going to be a really stacked race. Yep. And verifying, I just think he feels like a horse that is only going to continue to get better. And like I said, I love that Cox brought him back. Put him, Didn't put him in a stakes race right away. Put him in an allowance race. Let him get that confidence back. Looks so impressive in that race, though. Uh, so I, I think verifying, very legitimate horse. Yep, he did win that. That's the only effort since the juvenile. Um Moving along, I actually like verifying a lot. I, in fact, if there was a futures bet, you gave me a hundred bucks with a gun to my head and made me bet one horse, I'd probably be somebody like verifying at a, at a pretty decent price. Mm -hmm. I think we have him higher than most people do. I think so. Uh, yeah, but I'm very comfortable with that. I'm yeah, probably going to stick with same. that as long as I can. In the Risen Star, like you said, that's going to be a stacked race. We're going to learn a lot about verifying at that point. Absolutely. Uh, race. Uh, Ranking number three, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Victory Formation, another Brad Cox. Yeah. By Taprit. Not sure what's happening with him next, but he's the Smarty Jones champ. Yeah. Uh, he won over a pretty decent field there. So what do we have on uh, Victory Formation? Well, he's undefeated. I, I mean, I think that's where you can start is he's not he's not done anything wrong. And, you know, some of these horses we talked about, well, you know, the conditions weren't great or, well, you know, there was another horse that was a real monster in that race, you know, but no, this horse is undefeated. And uh, had his form flattered, beat a horse named Lugan Hill, who came back and won the Jerome Stakes at Aqueduct next time out. So, again, some of the things we talked about with Arabian Knight, with Red Root One, and with uh, uh, Determinedly, like you start paying attention to that stuff. Like what fields are coming back live, where even the horses finishing second and third are coming back to win a stakes race next time out. Like that's where you have to start paying attention. And until this horse does something wrong, I trust the connections. I trust the pedigree and I, I trust the form in that he's beating really good horses. So uh, excited to see what comes next for victory formation. Exactly what you said. So somebody like Arabian night a month ago, we saw a couple horses uh, further down on this list, lose to Arabian night. And at that point we're sitting there going, it's a non-factor Arabian night made him look stupid. Well, now we know how elite Arabian night is starting to look. So now just because Arabian night made a horse look bad, does not necessarily eliminate them from, uh, you know, being better than the other 90% of the, of the possible field here, because Arabian Knight has asserted himself as elite, if not number one, yeah. um, number two on our list, who so we'll just jump right into it Yeah. by uncle Mo trained by Baffert. We're going to get, we'll see what happens here next. looks like the rebel. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Arabian Knight coming off uh, a dominant performance at the Southwest. Geared down. Yeah. What did you see? Because I saw, I'll be honest, I was watching that race and I saw, I thought he was more geared back than anybody gave him credit for. Like you can tell when a horse is absolutely disinterested in winning because it's so easy. And that's yeah. the way it looked for Arabian Knight. He, and I think he could have yeah. won by a huge margin, but he, he was, he kind of was uh, ready to trot home. Yeah. And he was so much the best in that field. And yeah. what I saw, was a derby horse because he broke like a million bucks. That was an incredible break. One he, of the best breaks I've seen. And in and a while. That, when Close. you're in the Kentucky Derby, you better break well because it's a 20 horse field. So you, you, you better yeah. get out there. Broke well. He got out to the lead. It was not ideal conditions. In fact, it was bad conditions. 
and it just didn't matter. Like he was just like, I'm better than everybody else. And he just kind of, and it was the first time going two turns and he could not have looked more impressive, just pulling away. And that was a very nice field with red route one, with Jason's road, with Corona bolt, with, uh, I thought you know, it was a pretty, a, I thought, a bunch I of thought nice he was horses in that field and, uh, it just looks so much the best. Like everybody else. I thought Arabian night was the, the sure shot favorite deservingly, even money favorite. Mm -hmm but I did not think that it was going to be that easy. And he, it, it was easy. Yeah, it was easy. And interestingly enough, he is, I, I made this point to you offline. He has yet to run a race in California, which I don't think is by accident. And I, I actually like that a lot that, that Baffert kind of has these, this kind of Midwestern horse now suddenly for the Kentucky Derby. And, and I think there's kind of an interesting element to that horse obviously trains out at Santa Anita, but I like the fact that this horse travels and knows how to travel and brings his a game. We've seen forbidden kingdom and, you know, some of the horses from the last couple of years that only ran out there. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Baffert's, you know, moving to the next step and realizing that putting them into the mix in the, in the Florida and, you know, and th Other this is also, work. yeah, this is also, I think, the product of him just having so many horses. He's got to <laughs> yeah, place yeah, that, them. He, he's got to place them somewhere. But he's I got, think it's he's the got four horses in there. Night. He's got yeah. four horses in, in all the stakes races, or all the prep races exactly. coming up here. And yeah. what are you proving other than against yourself? With right, it's not his fault. Unfortunately, like it's just a ridiculous circumstance of California racing right now, where he's got. Yeah. We saw the San Vicente was th four horses. Yeah. We see uh, the Robert B. Lewis is going to be four horses. It was just yep. a joke. Yeah. And all these other circuits have legitimate, you know, legitimate races coming on. So, yeah, yeah. he has to, he had, he kind of has to throw some of his best horses out into other circuits to even see Absolutely. where he's at. Absolutely. So, to finish the list here, uh, number one, Forte by Violence, Todd Pletcher, targeting the Fountain of Youth. And I think yep. you're in full agreement with me on this. Forte is number one until Forte is defeated or taken off the trail because the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Champion is innocent until proven guilty. As far as uh, and I think particularly, I, I think particularly for Forte. And I know some people who watched our first video kind of pushed back on that assertion and said, "Well, you know that." And it's not just that he won the Breeders' Cup. It, people need to remember that was a really big duel that he had with Loggins, the race right before the Breeders' Cup. There's True. no excuse. There, there would have been all the excuses in the world to say that race took something out of Forte, maybe took a little bit too much time. What does he do? He comes back next time out, sits mid-pack, and just tracks down Cave Rock like it's nothing and passes him in the stretch. I mean, for a young horse to put those two efforts back-to-back, -back, th those are the two best efforts I've seen from this crop. So, and everybody, be honest with yourself you when, know, you, when you say that everybody took. I saw. I'm not going to say everybody, but a huge chunk of horse racing Twitter thought Cave Rock was a lock single on that. It was day. a single. It was. And a single I did not. Player the, yep. I didn't buy into it because I knew Forte was a monster yep. and Loggins for that matter. But Cave Rock had that much respect going in. That's my point. Yeah. And for Forte yeah. to come up there and, like you said, ran him down and beat him in a legit duel after the huge duel with Loggins. Yeah. This horse, I, I mean, I really hope that uh, everything's so safe and sound with him. It, you know, a lot of people say in, in these instances, like, you know, that they don't run them hard on purpose so that they're fresh for the Derby. Yeah. Maybe that's the case here with Pletcher. But uh, in any case, Forte is is the, the joint right now, baby. I think uh, it's going to be, you know, until he's beaten or until there's a reason to believe otherwise, that's the horse right now, right? That is, and I mean, he's obviously leading Kentucky Derby uh, futures and targeting that fountain of youth. Presumably, the, then would focus on the Florida Derby, and then focus on the Kentucky Derby. So, I mean, really, you're looking at two more races for Forte in all likelihood if he wins the fountain of youth, and uh, that's kind of where we're at with uh, our top twenty-five list. Yeah, and the only other thing is, if you're a recency bias person, Arabian Night just asserted himself as a solid, solid number two. Absolutely. In, in, in many cases, number one, just based on recency. But yep. it's starting to get fun, Matt. It's starting to get fun. We're starting to see this crop yeah. take, uh, you know, take take form. And it, we usually don't see it this early in the season. And maybe this thing's going to reset itself two or three times from here. But right now, it feels like we're starting to get a little bit of a grasp on the on the players here, which is exciting. Absolutely. And obviously a huge weekend coming up with those three derby prep races, the Robert B. Lewis, 
the Holy Bull, the Withers. So we're going to see three different circuits. You're going to see some new faces, particularly down at Florida. There's a lot of horses. We talked about Cyclone Mischief, but there's a lot of other horses in that field that are just kind of starting off. And and so we'll see, you know, somebody might emerge, somebody might pop, somebody might, you know, put up a really big effort. That's the beauty of these young horses is they've only had two or three races and maybe it's the fourth or fifth one that finally you start to see their full potential. I will say in agreement with you, I, I think that somebody will emerge out of this weekend. I have no idea who, because I don't see any, at this point, any superstars in any of these three races. There's a lot of solid, good horses that mm-hmm. could emerge. I have not I don't see a superstar amongst those three races, but I do feel feel like somebody's going to emerge out of these three. One of these horses is yeah. going to come out of this weekend looking like a star. Somebody's yeah. going to win in a big way, and uh, that's what we're looking for here is to see who's the next uh, big star to to rise up our list here. And we're going to update these every week or two or whatever it is to um, you know as long as these. The Derby prep season keeps on throwing us new curveballs. <laughs> so, Matt, thanks for joining, man. Appreciate yep. it. Pleasure. We'll do it again either uh, next week or probably next week after three after three big races yeah. this weekend. We're gonna have to. So, yep. thanks everybody for joining. Trust the profits. Please like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Plenty of content coming this week. Thanks for joining.